If you've done any work in your training attempting to try and improve your aerobic power, which is ultimately the top end of your engine and essentially your VO2 max, you've probably come across the training methodology called HIT, or otherwise known as high intensity interval training. Really effective way of being able to improve that top end, but you may not have stopped to understand exactly why we do these type of interval based protocols rather than just single efforts. Why can't we just go and run, ride or row at a maximal intensity for as long as we can and that's the end of our session. Why do we need to go through intervals and maybe some of the principles underpinning that as well. So in this video today, we're gonna to be covering why HIT is really effective, but then also why it's so different to just doing a single effort. Why is doing intervals gonna be much better for maximizing time at that top end, getting the best stimulus out of your sessions and ultimately not wasting any training time. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Hey, welcome back to the channel. Nick here, making sports science simple. And in this video, we're covering really the basis and underpinning of why high intensity interval training, otherwise known as HIT, is super effective for developing the top end of our engine and ultimately our VO2 max aerobic power. As we know, the size of the engine is everything. If we can have a bigger aerobic engine, work harder and faster at the top end for a longer period of time, that's gonna flow down to our sub-maximal intensity. So super applicable to a lot of endurance athletes, regardless of the distance, short, long distance, but also really applicable to our team sport athletes as well. They have a high amount of running components to their sports, so maybe soccer, football, those types of sports. So working on that VO2, realistically, it all comes back to the number one principle of this type of training is maximizing our time at and near VO2 max. That is the golden rule, if you like, in terms of trying to improve the top end and improve your aerobic power, how quickly you can turn that oxygen over and, and create aerobic energy. We're not talking about just how much, that's more your capacity, your long, slow training. We're talking about how quickly it happens. Because the faster we can convert essentially oxygen into usable energy by breaking down fuels using oxygen, that aerobic process, the better we're gonna be at those higher intensities. They're gonna be more sustainable. You can work at them for longer, less fatiguing and the like. It's ultimately gonna to lead to improved performance. So we need to maximize the time up there. And you might just think about that as, well, if I try to maximize my time at VO2 max, well, why can't I just go out and do something like a 2K time trial? Sure, that's a great testing testing tool, but is it the most effective way to get our time at VO2 or is, is intervals a much better way to go about it? Like why can't we, it's a good valid question to ask, why can't we just go out and in say a Tuesday and a Thursday in the week, my getting my high intensity for the week, so to speak, up, up and near VO2 max, why can't I just do a hard single effort, um, max, maximal effort for as long as I possibly can and that's gonna be my stimulus. Really the basis of that is because it's not actually that effective at gaining time at VO2. And the reason behind it is because it's quite limited. And there's a great study, I'm gonna put the graph up on the screen that really summarizes the, the premise of the study, but I think this one's really good to highlight it um, in, in terms of what we're talking about here. Fundamentally, the graph has got some squares and some triangles on it. Don't need to worry too much about the ins and outs and the exact numbers. What we're gonna talk through is the protocol and really the key difference in in being able to maximize time at VO2, because that's what this study looked at. It looked at, well, comparing a high intensity interval training protocol, so intervals working up near VO2 max versus one single effort, which is actually better? Which is more sustainable? Which one can we get more time at VO2? Because that's our key stimulus we're looking for. And so if we start off with the single effort, what we, what we see here in this study is we went to volitional fatigue. And all that means is the participants required to start out basically in the single effort, they were to go as hard as hard as they could at the protocol for as long as they could. So the protocol in that one was at 91% of their velocity at VO2 max. I'll get to that in a moment as to why it was 91 and why it wasn't 100% of their VO2 max as an intensity. But we're talking about 91% of their velocity at VO2 max. So just below that actual VO2 max intensity, they're running just a little bit shy of that. Start out, aim to hold that for as long as we possibly can. And if you see on the graph, and I might put it back up, you see they only lasted pre about that sort of nine, 10 minutes. If you're looking at very specifically, I'm looking very roughly here. If we were to go at about 100%, so we bang on 100%, they probably would have only lasted five or seven minutes. You might think that's a long period of time. Oh, 10 minutes at 90, 91% of my VO2 max. That is quite a long time. You'll be pretty exhausted at the end. And basically volitional fatigue essentially is to exhaustion. That's all, what it means. You cannot sustain the effort any further. So they get to the end of this nine, 10 minutes and they are absolutely exhausted. They couldn't do any more. They wouldn't be able to have a recovery and try and do that again. It's a type of thing that we get a decent amount of time here, nine, 10 minutes. But if you actually have a look at graph, it's not actually nine to 10 minutes of time VO2. That's nine to 10 minutes of time spent at 91%. That's how long they lasted in terms of a time to exhaustion. 
It's not how much time I actually spent at VO2. You can see the line across there at about three and a half thousand mils in terms of their absolute oxygen consumption is that VO2 line we're trying to hit. We wanna try and stay up there as long as we can. But we notice there's this bit of a lag period. There's always gonna be a lag at the start of a session where we increase the intensity, but our oxygen supply isn't quite meeting the demand that we need of that intensity. It's what we call an oxygen deficit. We can't actually instantaneously, and you will know this through something like heart rate, we can't instantaneously go from a heart rate of 60 to 160. It takes a bit of time to get there. Even though our intensity might've gone up, I can be stationary here and, and not moving at zero kilometers per hour, if you like, and get up and very quickly I can get to 15, 16, 18 kilometers an hour if I wanted to, but it's the type of thing my oxygen consumption doesn't come up that quickly. I produce the energy a bit anaerobically to begin with just to get me going. So the body tries to play catch up. That's why we have that lag. So in terms of actual time at our maximal oxygen consumption, it's limited even further again. I'd argue it's probably even that five or seven minutes. And if you did 100% VO2 in this protocol, you probably would only have maybe three to four minutes of actual time at VO2 max that you accumulate. So we're getting very small amounts. And at the end of it, the, I guess the trade-off here is we're not actually accumulating massive amounts of time. It's not really that effective because it's one and done essentially in terms of your effort. And, it, and ultimately it's not gonna give us much more of a stimulus than that. So really doing a single effort probably isn't the best way to go about it. And that's where the triangles on this graph and what we had with the high intensity interval protocol is far more effective at maximizing time at VO2. So the, the comparison here is that the clear triangles or the white triangles you can see on the graph is that hit protocol. We're looking at 30 seconds on at 100%. So we've lifted the intensity, but we're only going for a short period of time before we then have a rest, which was back down another 30 seconds at 50% 50, 50 of VO2 max. So we're on 30 seconds at 100, off 30 seconds at 50, and the participants were required to repeat that again and again and again until volitional fatigue. So same thing as the the, the single uh, single effort group, they had to just keep repeating this, this protocol until they could not go any further. Now, the obvious thing on this graph is you can see those triangles going on forever compared to that single effort. That's because they're able to sustain it for a longer period of time. The obvious answer to this is, well, those guys got a rest period every 30 seconds. Yeah, they did, which ultimately, if you have a look at there, it's like, well, if I'm gonna get a rest period, then I go hard again, it's much easier to do that and go really hard and then have a break, really hard and have a break, than try and just go really hard and sustain it. At some point, you will fatigue. But if you get these little rests, it allows you to repeat that a little bit more freely. And we're only going 30 seconds at a time here. So short blocks, on, off, on, off. We still have that deficit we talked about. There is a bit of a lag in where that oxygen consumption comes up right at the beginning. It takes a little bit longer for oxygen consumption to come up because we're only on for 30 seconds at a time. In the single effort group, they were on and on continuously. So oxygen consumption is constantly just on the rise as we increase throughout throughout the duration of that test, if you like, or that, that protocol. Same goes for the 30 on 30 off. It's just gonna take a bit longer because we're only on for 30 seconds and we're back down. So oxygen consumption zigzags a little bit. Rather than this continuous increase, it goes up and down. You'll see some of those little triangles actually dip quite low comparative to up. This is the interesting part. Once we get to that same length that those uh, that the squares, if you like, or that single effort lasted, about that nine, 10 minute mark. As we started to accumulate further beyond that, the 30 second on, 30 second off protocol continued, you can see that's where oxygen consumption is really starting to make, make its uh, presence felt at VO2 max intensity, around that three and a half thousand mil. That's really where our golden time is beginning. There is still some good quality time before that. We're getting very, very close, but it's taken a little bit longer. But then what you can see here is because of that, once we do catch up, the body's more likely to stay up there because the 30 seconds off isn't really at that point enough for it to drop back down. We've just broken through the deficit, so we're supplying enough oxygen now. We're trying to meet that demand as best we can when we've got that on effort, and we're on at a slightly harder intensity too, which helps that. But in that off, once we get to a point where oxygen consumption is kind of meeting demand, it doesn't want to drop back down. It doesn't have time to drop back down. 30 seconds off and we're still working. 50% of VO2 max is an active recovery. That's gonna be pretty much a slow jog. It's not gonna be a walk or a passive. It's gonna be slow jogging or pretty comfortably jogging. So oxygen consumption is still in the system. That supply is now gonna equal demand on the work effort and then be slightly above because it doesn't wanna drop down. If it drops back down, it's gonna be really hard to get through these deficits again and again. So the body naturally is gonna to wanna to keep oxygen consumption elevated. And this is the really key part to things like high intensity intervals and why something like 30 on 30 off can be a really effective protocol is that you can see here, oxygen consumption basically doesn't move then. For the rest of the, the volitional, uh, volitional fatigue test and the rest of the protocol, oxygen consumption stays up uh, at that exact 100% of, of VO2 max point, even in the recovery periods. Those triangles barely move between 30 on, 30 off. So what we have here is even the rest periods, we're getting a really good stimulus. So now we're actually doubling our time at VO2 
because where we do a single effort, it's like, well, one and done. Well, once we start to recover, that's, that's not giving us any further bang for buck in terms of stimulus. When we're on, we're getting the stimulus. When we're off, particularly at the back end of this session, we're still getting the stimulus. So that, that'll more likely happen in shorter efforts. And I won't go into too much detail about longer efforts, like two minute on, two minute off. Probably not gonna get as much of an effect there, but in terms of that, on, that off period being as effective. But in shorter efforts like this, 30 on, 30 off, the off period is acting as time at VO2 as well. So it accumulates together. And that's where we have not only participants being able to last and last at that protocol for 26, 27 minutes significantly further, that's also gonna to accumulate to more time at VO2. You can even just see off that, from that 10 minute mark all the way through to about the 26, 20, 26 and a half minute mark right at the end is time at VO2. That's gonna be about sort of 16 minutes worth. And we've had a bit of lag period at the start. Compare that to our initial, we're almost doubling if not more what our time at VO2 max was compared to that single effort group. So that's really where the bang for buck is. High intensity intervals, maximize that time at VO2 like we said before, which is so critical to improving VO2 max and aerobic power overall. So hopefully that gives you a little bit more insight in terms of the background as to why HIT is really effective. I think it's really important to understand that because that makes applying it in practice a little bit more uh, meaningful in terms of knowing what, what is this hard work doing. It's always a bit difficult going out there and doing near maximal efforts, really hard sets, uh, potentially sometimes with short recoveries and going hard again. It's really difficult to do that if you don't really understand why it's being effective and, and how to maximize it. So I think it's really important to visit some of that base physiology. If you have any questions around the HIT side of things, or let me know in the comments as well, your favorite HIT session for improving VO2 max, happy to have that discussion because I think it's really important we understand these principles. We get maximum bang for buck. Because like I said earlier, it's all about maximizing your training time. We don't want to be wasting any of it. And if we can tweak some of your protocols or improve some of that training a little bit better, it's gonna make a world of difference in terms of maximizing your overall program to then maximize your performance. So hopefully you got a bit out of this video today. I'm gonna to leave it there and we'll see you in the next one.